just J Mike. Warning. This podcast may contain graphic descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Prepare yourself or do not enter. You in danger, girl. Greetings, and welcome through the creaking door to Bent and Twisted, the podcast where we lounge by a toasty fire and tell each other true tales of the nauseous and the nightmarish over Nightcaps and Nepal Kush. I'm your host, JR, and I'll be joined, as always, by my co-hosts, Jay and Khadija, for this creepy account of true crime and mayhem. Party favors for this episode are Night Bee Cocktails, made with elvish honey and a buffet tray of smokable flowers from Lothlorien Gardens, the one weed that rules them all. We save the best seat by the fire just for you, so make yourself comfortable as I relate to the crew the convoluted tale of two teens, a train, and some good old boys up to some dirty old shit. The twisted tale of the 1987 Henry Ives Murders. Movie recent. The Ridge? Yeah, it, well, they were the one from 1990 something to that. Well, I don't know when it came out. It's probably like early, late 90s. Brendan Fraser, Fraser went. That movie was so terrible. Yes. I Yeah, I never saw it. It wasn't a great movie. My dad was a huge, like, universal horror fan, like, classic universal horror, so. It was more of an adventure movie, though. Really yeah. It was a completely different film. Oh, yeah. It wasn't at all like... They weren't going even going for the... I, I, I mean, I'm thinking like Boris Karloff. Yeah, they uh, weren't even going for the... And then Frasier. No, he was walking around, talking. I think The Rock is in it. That was like the third one, yeah. That was the second one. I don't know. They first gave him the glimpse of the Scorpion King, and then... The, then he had his own movie, The Scorpion King, which I made sure I didn't say. Because I really did not like Lolly 2. I think I liked What's Her Face? The chick in the movie. What's that chick? She was in other movies. I wouldn't. I was like, you mean the wife or the... That lady. What was, that was in those movies. Yeah, <laughs> that female who was on that, that side. The one that, the, roman- the romantic interest of the movie. Yeah, she ended up being a, like in a bunch of Oscar Oscar nominated movies later. I didn't know that. Well, what other movies was she in? She was what I want to say the. Excuse me. I don't talk about with either one. Excuse me. She fuck players. Excuse me. I apologize. I never accept. Fuck up. Look at the weird. I am not. I'm not. I'm singing. Releasing a font of power. That's sexist. Sure. <laughs> That's racist. Sure. How dare you? <laughs> How dare I? How very, very dare you? But he asked her question. I'm helping. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry for who you are, JR. Yeah, be sorry for it because it's terrible. Terrible. Don't be sorry for it. It's a terrible thing. So what were you saying? Yeah. <laughs> Khadij. What were you telling us? Uh, when? I wish to know. I don't know. No, you uh, don't know. Fuck me. You want no. <laughs> you want no. <laughs> <laughs> Not entertaining then. Fuck off. Now I don't care. Okay, I'm ready when everyone is ready. 
Why are you looking at me like that? What makes you think I'm not thinking that I'm ready? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, this is truly one of my favorite true, true crime stories. I've mentioned it to you guys many times, and I've referenced it. And, you know, it's because it's got a bunch of conspiracy that turns out that it may or may not be conspiracy or whatever. And just to blanket this whole thing, a lot of this information is pieced by witnesses. Nothing was ever... So just take that. Most of this is alleged. FYI. Yes. Yes, Khadija, you do have a voice on this podcast. I'm just using my sign language right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah, so it's got a bunch of conspiracies that pretty much have been substantiated and it pieces together a story that's really fucked up. And so today I am doing The Boys on the Tracks. Yay! Thank you, thank you. It's like a plot, like a whole... Studio applause. <laughs> there was just stupefaction around. It's like just dumb sound. And big old eyes and <laughs> flared nostrils. I'm finally going to do it, guys. <laughs> Doing it. Okay. The so we're going to start the story off in August 22nd, 1987, Arkansas. Huh? I think you're peeking a little. Oh, God damn it. Okay, I just have to talk a little bit softer. All right. So we're going to start in. Bryant Salem County, Arkansas, August 22nd, 1987. Fun fact, 10 days after I was born. Oh, jeez. Yes, yeah, so I feel like a part of this story. Is that it? Or are you pandering for gifts? Pandering for gifts, thank you. <laughs> Can you message, send them to P.O. Box? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1313 Mockingbird Lane. So, two teenagers, dead. two teenage boys... 17-year-old Kevin Ives and 16-year-old Don Henry, uh, who had been friends for a very long time. They were the normal 1980s kids. Uh, think Stranger Things without Stranger Things. I don't know what that means. I don't uh, watch that <laughs> So What? <laughs> so, one night, they were out on, the, on August 22nd. Uh, they were hanging out with friends at a local parking lot convenience store. Later, around midnight, they stop at home and they ask, because uh, Don was spending the night at Kevin's house. So they go back home and Kevin asks at midnight, which I'm like, okay. But Kevin asks his dad, can they go hunting? Because I guess that was a big thing around there. Dad's like, sure, go ahead, be careful, whatnot. Uh... <laughs> So yeah, they check in with their dad, and then they were they uh, go out and they do something called spotlight hunting, which is a legal form a an illegal form of hunting where you take your flashlight. Mm-hmm. Say a deer's like coming by, you take your flashlight, blind them to where they're kind that of stunned, fun, and then kill them. And it, that's why it's illegal because it's like you're essentially cheating the system. So yeah, so they went out doing that, and. They head out into the woods that they practically grew up in. So it's not like they're wandering out into the middle of the woods where it's just like they don't know where they're going. They know where they're going and they know exactly what they're at when they're there. So, but little did they know that this would be their last adventure ever. That was kind of corny. So, I don't know, like... So the next morning, a train conductor made a horrifying discovering so okay get this it's nighttime and it's like 4 a.m 4 25 a.m a 75 car 6,000 ton cargo train is going from texarkana to little rock Ark- little rock arkansas the train is obviously going at train speeds the conductor his name is steven Schur- Sch- Oh, sorry. His the conductor. His name is Stephen Schroyer. He's driving, doing his normal conducting shit, and then he sees something out in the middle of the tracks. And at first, he thinks it's an animal, 
But then as he gets closer, he begins to realize that it's not an animal, but instead he realizes that it's two young boys laying motionless on the track. How far away is he? Um, I'm not quite sure how far away he was, but I uh, will kind of give you some clue. Like, so he he sees the boys. He starts ringing his horn, hoping that they'll get up and get the hell out of the way. They usually can see like 50 feet or maybe sometimes more up the tracks ahead of. Well, it's night, right? Mm-hmm. So he's ringing the horn, and then he puts on the brakes, and he's knowing that these brakes aren't going to stop in time. He's knowing, but he's just hoping that they will move. And But his hopes came crashing down, because at that point, he ends up running them over. Um, As is usually the problem with trains, because they can't slow, like they... They can't slow down in an instant. Yeah. They can't just immediately stop. So, Stephen calls the police, and when he does, uh, the police ask him, as they, does he have any, the police ask Stephen, does he have any injuries to report? And Stephen goes, quote, no, we've got death. So, once the train stops, the crew goes out and they see the carnage. They've had experience in hunting, so they know that when you, when something is killed or you know, hit or something when they're alive, the blood is red and free free flowing, you know. But in this case, when they went out there, they saw that the boy, uh, the, they saw the boys, you know, mangled pieces, and the blood was purple in color, thick and oozing, which to them indicated that the boys were already dead when they hit them. That would have been a while, too. Like, that would have been several yeah. hours. Of yeah. So, it will, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was night. Uh, yeah, it was night. It was in the morning. So from the time the boys went out at 12 to go hunting to 4.25. Um, Do we know what time they came out? That they left to go hunting? Uh, yeah, 12 o'clock, midnight. So they also pointed out later that, you know, they were hoping that the boys would move out of the way when... They were coming through, but not one of them flinched at all. They didn't move. They didn't do anything. And that implied to them that, you know, because if you're going to be ran over by a train, regardless if you're doing it on purpose or not, you're going to cower, flinch, do something. These well, boys, if you're conscious, if well, right, but exactly. You know, if you're the uncarved block, you know, if you've made your peace with the Zinbat. See, yeah. anything coming at you is going to make you flinch. No, well, you know, I, I knew you were doing this. Sure. Stuff. Okay, well, <laughs> so, so they pointed that out. Oh. I mean, if they were suicidal, but these were kids going out hunting at night and smoking weed. Oh, those are the ones that were on the track? Oh, I'll, I'll get, yeah, I'll Sorry. go to that. So, now, even though these hunters who knew what they were doing... Or who, they who had been hunters before, and they knew what to look out for, even though they mentioned to the authorities that it ended up eventually arriving to the crime scene. They mentioned to them, they say what they think, this, these boys were already killed, they were covered in a green tarp, blah, 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 blah. Even though all of that, the police immediately considered it an accident or a suicide. Because that's what they, they do. usually do if yeah. they can. Right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Is that an accident or a suicide? Let's go get some donuts. So, yeah. because of this, it means that the scene was not properly secured. Mm. Evidence was not properly collected, and they even let the next train pass right through the car- crime scene. So, now you've got another 6,000 ton... Go ahead. Now you've got another 6,000 ton train running through all the evidence and crime scene, ruining everything. Go ahead. Go ahead. (laughs) I'm just going to put these nuts in my mouth. That's okay. I was just stuck on them. Okay. So 
they let the you know they let this crime scene go to hell but even the paramedics had suspicion and they tried to tell the authorities but they weren't listening they weren't listening obviously they made it seem like a suicide so the authorities wrote a note in their records you know whatever chart that they have noting that this crime scene looks suspicious and and noting that the conditions suggested that they had been dead long before. Now, it's morning time. So we're going from maybe, like, or not maybe, we're going from about... Long before. Huh? You said long before. What are you talking about? You said long before. Long before what? Just... You're confusing me. So... I just repeated what you said. So... <laughs> We go from 12 midnight mm-hmm. to 425 when the boy's body was ran over. Mm-hmm. Now it's morning time, like sun up, people going about their day, starting to go about their day. Now we go to Kevin's parents, who let the boys go out hunting. But later that morning, when their boys hadn't gotten home, the parents began to worry and they started to notify each other. Now at this point, now, oh, this is okay. At this point, there had already been a rumor going around that two teenage boys had been shot and tied to the tracks. So, yeah, exactly. Already You're going around the, the town because it's a small town. town. It's a small town. How many people? I don't know. You ask these questions as if like, well, like if four thousand people. Oh shit! I mean, like, uh, come on, it's going around the whole town. Everybody heard about the police. Okay. Well, well, that's did the police hear about it? That's the question. Well, we'll get into it later. We'll have to go to the donut shop and ask. <laughs> so, eventually, the police show up to the Kevin's homes, and they come with the, some of the boys' clothing, and they were able to identify the boys' clothing state, and they were able to identify the boys' clothing, confirming the deaths of the boys, uh, confirming the deaths of Kevin Ives and Don Sawyer. So, shortly after the medical report released by the state medical examiner, who was a fucking idiot, named Fami Malik, he was an Egyptian born phys- he was an Egyptian born physician, and he ruled the death an accident, as the authorities did, stating at the time, and get this. Standing at the time of the boy's accident, the boys were under the influence and passed out due to 20 marijuana cigarettes when the train ran over them. 20? 20, causing their death. Damn. Right. Now, the boy's family was like, no. Marijuanas. Yeah, Yeah. 20 marijuanas. The marijuanas, 20 of them. (laughs) So, the family of the boys were like, you're fucking wrong, and they didn't believe that this was, they didn't believe it. You know, it's like, it wasn't the 20 marijuana cigarettes that the doctor say claimed that these boys had. Shit. They believed their boys were good kids, and even though there was a dime bag found in one of the boys' pockets, found after the clothes were kids found after the clo- after the clothes were returned to them, so the police didn't even find it. It was found by the parents. And it was also go ahead. I'm doing this. I'm putting it here. And so it was also only a little bit of pot, not able to render them unconscious. Not twenty, where you'd have to th- roll twenty little needle joints, right? That would render them unconscious. <laughs> so, so there was no way that they could have fallen asleep on the tracks. Even so, if you're going to pass out, you're not going to pass out perfectly on the tracks, you know. One of you's going to pass out to the left. One's going to pass out forward. And there's not going to be some unison <laughs> passing out. It could be synchronous on the track on the on the tracks. <laughs> it could be synchronous. So <laughs> planned out. Okay. Coordinate- choreographed. Choreographed. So now we're going to go to Doctor Malik. At this point, the parents start losing faith in the authorities and Doctor Malik when they started noticing weird things. So, firstly, the town goes fucking crazy, and like any normal person, wants to go check out the crime scene that wasn't secured properly. 
um, Slinky. When down there, a family member of the boys finds one of the boys' shoes with one of the boys' foot in it. Yeah. And this is two or three days after the accident. Nobody decided to check and see how many feet they had with No. In fact, the autopsy had already been done. So, and there was no record of they missing didn't feet. They report that there is a foot missing. Oh, my God. Maybe somebody had two right feet. But they didn't report any feet missing. That is a ter- that is a terrible joke. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying it like that. I've been like, oh, maybe serious? they took a foot that belonged to one person and attributed it to both people, maybe. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay. I don't know. I get, <laughs> I get, I get that look. I get that look. Sure. <laughs> so now here's my favorite part. So if we go back to the train conductor and his crew, um, they also told the train conductor and his crew who had no stake in this at all. It's not like they're gaining any benefit from lying. It's nothing like that. The crew that had told them about the green tarp that they found, that they saw on the boys, the police told them that it was an optical illusion that they all shared and that there was never a green tarp. A shared optical illusion. What is Chris Hart around, or what is that guy? It has been known to happen. However. David Copperfield. Okay. Oh, uh, shit! What's his name? David Blaine? No. Uh, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> what? Chris Angel. There you go. Oh God. <laughs> Good Lord. Okay. So five months after, uh, five months. So for five months, Kevin and Don's parents didn't let this situation go. They tried to go through authorities and to look more into it. But when this failed, they said, fuck this. And they decided to go to the media, which is always a good plan. If you want something to be. Well, seven on your side can't do everything. <laughs> well, in this case, seven on your side probably did. So, because the plan works, and the next day the case had been reopened. Because remember, Dr. Malik, the autopsy dude, ruled it a suicide, you know, or an accident case closed. But because of this, they reopened the case. Um, so, a new, a, a new, a prosecutor named Richard Garrett had the boys' bodies resumed. And this led to a creation of a grand jury led by an attorney named uh, Prosecutor Dan Harmon. Prosecutor Dan Harmon? Yes. That's his name? Yes. Well, no, his name is Dan Harmon, but he's a prosecutor named Dan Harmon. He doesn't come in the way. Probably. I mean, it'd be some bomb-ass move, but... uh, Really? So... Maybe uh, that's right. So he's a friend of the other prosecutor, Richard, um, and he was in the mix from the beginning, Dan Harmon. Okay, you're going to have to hold on here for a second. <laughs> I'm just going to put him in here. I'm going to cut some lots in here. And then you won't even know I have that. So, all right, there we go. All right. Well, now you want to probably chew while it's going off. <laughs> all right. What the fuck? I tell you people be acting a fool around here. Okay. So, this dude, the friend of the first prosecutor, uh, Dan Harmon, uh, he started to be in the mix way from the beginning. He volunteered his time to the boy's parents free of charge, and he eventually became the head of the grand jury that was created by a judge, to so he was able to supervise the investigation. Now, a new medical examiner who wasn't as dumb as Dr. Malik was uh, appointed. And this medical examiner came to the conclusion that the boys had only smoked two to three joints at the time of the death. And one of the boys' shirts had been had tears in it on the back, which was consistent with a sharp object and oh. like a knife. As well as finding on the shirt of one of the boys the same marks, indicating that those were stab marks, because it matched up the the tears in the shirt 
match the tears in the back of the boys. One of the boys. So, uh, uh, and if it had been from the, if it had been from the train, it'd been a lot more messy than it really was. Like the shirt and stuff would have been a lot more messed up and stuff like that. Um, more than that, there were injuries on the boys' faces indicated that they had been hit with a blunt object. Like the same boy is one of the boys. When I, the article I was reading didn't really indicate which boy it was. One boy got his ass fully beaten. Right. So it indicated like they had been back, uh, hit in the head with a blunt object. So, so Dr. Man, Dr. Malik's verdict was overturned. And this time the death was brief. And this time the death was deemed probable homicide. So now there's movement forward. But with this movement forward, Dr. Malik disagreed with this verdict. He didn't believe anyone laid a hand on uh, a finger on the boys. He didn't believe anyone laid a finger on those boys and wouldn't give over any evidence, nothing. And okay. Now Dr. Malik had some issues himself. And this is one of the things where it's like starts going all over the place. Around the time of Doctor, uh, around the around the time of all this, Doctor Malik was involved with a controversial with a controversial ruling involving a patient's nurse. The woman facing legal issue was a woman named Virginia Kelly, and Doctor Malik was trying to defend the nurse by fudging the facts a little bit, trying to get her off of whatever crime or you know issue she was being accused for. Now, I'm sure no one will know this person, but just by chance, does anybody, does the name Virginia Kelly ring a bell to anyone? Not just off screen. Kelly. No. No. Okay. So. (coughs) Excuse me. Excuse me. Hold on. I'm kind (coughs) of. Okay. Go ahead. Losing the suspension. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, you don't want to do it while I was doing that. Okay. So, so this woman, Virginia Kelly, she was the mother of the then Ar- she was the mother of the then Arkansas governor, Bill Clinton. She was the who of him? The mother of Bill Clinton. And who is she? So she was a nurse who was a, eventually accused of malpractice. Dr. Malik was brought in to testify for the nurse. Oh, this is in the 80s before he got to be yes, popular. Yes, exactly. So, Bill Clinton's mother was accused of malpractice two times. So, yeah, Dr. Malik was representing Bill Clinton's mother for two malpractice suits. Just to catch everyone up on that one. Um lost my place now he fudged everything up which ended up i believe leading to her be her have her charges or whatever dismissed and even though he fudged it up um you know maybe that was his first time kind of you know fudging some shit up no there was also some other incidences that made malik stupid (laughs) over (laughs) Over his career, his rulings became problematic for over 20 additional deaths. Because of this, his rulings were constantly being reversed by jurors and contested by other medical examiners. And I'm going to give you two examples of how ridiculous this shit is. First one. In a case, in one case, a man was found shot dead in his yard. Dr. Malik deemed it a suicide. But the man had been shot five times in the chest. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to find your heart. You know. <laughs> Is it though? Well, it's not exactly on the left side. You get trained to think it's on the left side, but it's, it could be any number of it, places here. It's but, which course the center. Then, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but it's all about where your heart lies at the end of the day. Well, I mean, all right. So his was spattered all over the yes. ground. Unfortunately. So in another case, another man, another man was found dead in his home. Dr. Malik deemed the death to be caused by an ulcer, but the man had been decapitated. His ulcer decapitated? Apparently. 
Well, you know, when that ass had that stomach ass, you know, <laughs> just clean up. Dr. You'll get up into the duodenum <laughs> and then this area here in your neck area. And then well, just so, like thick, like the stomach acid just kind of bubble out and maybe your head falls off. Well, when Dr. Malik was questioned about it, Malik said the man had been sitting dead for a while and the dog chewed through his neck. Oh, the dog took his head. Even though it was a clean slice. This led to the main suspect, a known criminal, to it's be just, found not guilty. A dog with what? OCD. Yep. What? Hell, because yep. the dog did it. The dog. Uh, the dog. <laughs> the fucking, dog did it. The dog did the it. Dog the dog had a little precision. Dog had a little OCD. Yeah, you know, it was a little. Just had to make sure everything was yeah, clean and everything perfect. Was lined up, you know. It's just because the dog did it, and you know, it's okay. <laughs> case solved <laughs> so with all this the families initially contested malik's findings but at some point he got so upset and slammed down the autopsy photos in front of them yelling about how he was right being so forceful that police had to come into the room to restrain him so he's essentially throwing pictures of their son's corpses all torn up and shit Showing them, trying to explain to them while he's why he's right. To explain to the families why he his ruling was the right one and not the new one that was deemed probable homicide. He was saying that it was a suicide. Yes, he was the first guy that came in. Was like, no, they and could. He was saying that like scattered body parts could explain why they would kill themselves. And pretty much, you know what? Justice is a rough road. <laughs> oh, most definitely. <laughs> you know, it's just sometimes. You know, the stress of being just can just build up too much, and you know. Justice. Justice is just right around the corner. <laughs> so, now, because he was involved with, like, Clinton and shit like that, when, the, when Clinton was asked to comment about the boys on the tracks case, Clinton praised Malik and found that his mistakes was just caused by being overworked and underpaid. So he's a pretty much saying like, hey, okay, reporters go or whoever goes to him saying Malik's verdict was overturned. And this new guy is saying it was this. And now the courts are deeming it probable homicide. Okay. Clinton excuse for Malik's mistake was that he was overworked and underpaid. I told you. Justice is a rough road. Yes. The road. So the road hardest to travel. Um. So even Clint, even even Clinton, so technically even Clinton clarified that Malik was wrong. Just putting that there. Um, which, you know, would lead to someone being, like, reprimanded. You made a mistake. I know even if I made a mistake at work, I would have been talked to or something to that nature. Right? Sure. No. Instead, Clinton, two months after the probable death grand jury finding... He sent a proposal requesting to raise Malik's salary by 41.5%. Typical. 41% raise. Mm-hmm. God damn. Yeah. It's like, I'm gonna milk this until somebody realizes I'm fucking bullshit. I mean, I mean, but the thing is, is that he believed himself. It's not even him trying to bullshit. He believed himself. After, it's, he, it's, he, yeah, he had to have just thought he was this god of people you know doctor i don't know i don't know how to refer to him so okay god of people <laughs> so here's a, a lot of man <laughs> i'm gonna be the goddess of god of people i'm gonna okay. be the goddess of show so <laughs> now here's here's a funny fact that i like just a small little tidbit at a hearing um about this dumbass's pay raise, Linda Ives, Kevin's mother, and a group of other Malik haters form a group called the Victims of Malik's Incredible Testimony, otherwise known as Vomit. <laughs> what? So pretty much the people who are pissed off at the Dr. Malik oh, okay. formed a group and named Victims vomit. of Malik's Incredible Beautiful. Testimony and named it Vomit. <laughs> Love it. Creative. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm from Vomit. I'm from Vomit. <laughs> I don't know. I'm that's... representing Vomit. I don't know if that's the flex we think it is. I <laughs> just don't know. All right. So we're going to leave Malik behind now. He's essentially done with this whole thing. 
now we're going to dive into another pool. Um, so I, seven months after Kevin and I, Kevin and Don's death, there was a police report where it was stated that police informant states that she had been told that the area the two boys died in was a drop zone for drugs. That's just the beast of this tavern. I'm sorry, people. There's nothing we could do about it. So the area that the boys had died was a drop zone for drugs. Um, So in the years surrounding the death of the boys, residents around the mean residents around the Mina municipal airport, which was about two hours out from Bryant. um, The residents complain about low flying airplanes in the middle of the night. Turns out, Mina was a drug running hub in the 80s and 90s. And this is where a guy named Barry Seal ran a drug ring. So pretty much they would bring drugs from over from Columbia to this airport. And some guy named Barry Seal was kingpin of this whole thing. Um, so, but at the point of the boy's death, Barry, ha- Barry had already been assassinated by Colombians. So this has nothing, he has technically nothing to do with it, but this whole setup with the drug delivery was his. So this setup's happening and part of the assassination for Barry Seal was because he was like working for the, working with the DEA and working for all these other government factions. And this whole setup was just another thing that he was doing. But the airport, the local authorities didn't know anything about these things, these government things and these connections happening. So when they found out that the area may have been a drop zone for drugs, they put cameras in the airport, big lights, so they can see if anybody's coming in and delivering drugs. Um, But instead of stopping the smugglers, they decided to drop the cargo mid-flight. So one of so essentially they'd be in the middle of the air, get over a certain area, open the doors and push the drugs out and it would fall and they would come gather it and leave. <clears throat> Doesn't sound very efficient at all, but okay. The history of uh cocaine bear. Yeah. That actually comes up a few times <laughs> while I was researching. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um So now the area that the drugs would fall to was the area where Don and Kevin was found. Um, So yeah, so the drugs drop zone is where Don and Kevin was found. Now we're going to kind of move a little forward into the years following the boy's death. At this point, witnesses start beginning to come forward. And this is where I'm talking about how there are so many witnesses and each witness had a different point of view. And because of that, it created a very consistent and substantiated timeline. So this is what I mean where it's essentially been solved, but nothing has come of it. Um, so the years following, witnesses start to come forward. And it begins to tell a story of what happened that night. So we're going to start with a boy named Tommy. Tommy Nyhouse. At the time of the murder, he was only 12 years old. Nyhouse, uh... He says that the night of the murders, he was in the woods by some tracks with his friends. And they spotted from the woods a group of men on the tracks. They end up seeing Kevin and Don approaching the men. And when they see the men on the tracks... Kevin and Don tried to walk away. Pretty much kind of like going, oh shit, this is not a situation we need to be into. Mm -hmm. Um, But the men called them to come forward. You know, walk toward them. Um, Should I keep losing my place? I'm sorry. So, okay. So they told the boys to come over. And I guess, I don't know why it was iffy for Tommy, but at some point a shot was fired and Tommy didn't know from who. It was, uh, was it the boy's gun or was it the men's gun? He didn't realize where the gunshot came from. But at that point, Kevin and Don had taken off. 
So they're running off through the woods. Okay. Now, Tommy, and this is where it starts getting even more, you know, all over the place. Tommy, the kid, recognized one of the boys, or sorry, Tommy, the kid, recognized one of the men because his mom was dating him. The guy he recognizes is special grand juror, appointed led Dan Harmon. What? Doing something. Sorry. <laughs> Shit. Dan Harmon. Yeah. <laughs> so the man that he identifies is prosecutor Dan Harmon. Oh. Right. So now Dan Harmon, other than being the hero. Dan Harmon. He's in the mix in all the wrong ways now. Um, so after Tommy gives his story, Tommy passes polygraph tests, and because it was substantiated so hard, he was put into a witness protection and gave witness statements telling his account of the story, which essentially is meaning to authorities and outside authorities, essentially meaning that he's a reliable witness. So the boys, based off of the witness testimony, ran into the, uh, afterward by another witness, ran into their friends, Keith Cohen, who gave them a lift on his motorcycle to the nearby payphone. Now the, net wit- now the next witness to observe something was Ronnie Goodwin. He says he was driving by a parking lot near the, a corner store where he noticed two boys, Kevin and Don, and then noticed two officers show up in an unmarked cop car only recognizing it because of, you know, all the antennas and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So Ronnie drives past into another parking lot and witnesses the cops beating the two boys, including hitting them in the head with the butt of the rifle and then throwing them into the back of their car. So that, remember how they said earlier that there were uh, bludgeon marks on them? Uh Uh-huh. It was because this now connects what the bludgeon marks was. Oh, wow. It was so the back of the gun. Huh? Huh? So this whole town is corrupt. Yeah. And I'm also going to get more into that too. Um, so they hit them. They hit the boys over the back of the head with the, the butt of their rifle. And then they throw them in back and they throw them in the back of the police cruiser. And then they start driving down a dirt path that leads back into the woods. Now, there are two other witnesses who can vouch for other parts of the story, um, including parts that Ronnie had stated. And when they were called to testify in the the new grand jury, before they had a chance to testify, they were both murdered. Sorry, excuse me, allegedly murdered. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'll get back to them in a second. The next witness to come forward in 1993 is a woman named Charlene Wilson. Now, Charlene... But Charlie had like a coming to Jesus moment and she gave secret testimony that included confession videos and signed testimony. So at the time of the boy's murder, she was okay. Got to leave back to the boy more at the time of the boy's murder. She was dating prosecutor Dan Harmon. Wow. He got around. Oh my God. Yeah. She claimed to be on the tracks that night with Harmon and a guy named Keith McCassell. Um, Keith McCassell was a known meth dealer um, and a police informant. And they were also with another, a few other local cops. They were there because the summer of 1987, so around that time, one of the drops that they, you know, dropped off from the plane mm-hmm. had disappeared. Well, as you would expect, some of them would. Exactly. So... Uh, so they think some local kids came and found it and took it home, obviously, like you just said. Or a cocaine bear got it. Or a cocaine bear got it. Actually, that's one of the... <laughs> oh, <my> gosh, <laughs> God, stop it. So I think it was more of a... a yeah. 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 So um, because of this, Kingpin Dan Harmon is royally pissed off. So he sends some of his men to watch the delivery site the same night Kevin and Don were murdered. They were expecting a delivery of three to four pounds of coke and five pounds of weed. And his girlfriend, Charlene, was supposed to do the pickup that night. 
So she, she, however, she couldn't do it because she was highballing, which is being on a mixture of coke and meth. Oh, fun. Yeah. Good. So she couldn't do the pickup. They told her to wait in the car, and she did until she saw Tommy, the little boy, the first, like the first person I mentioned, running away from the gun, sh- running away from gunshots. She leaves the car, and then she goes to where the men are. And she goes to where the men intercepted the boys. And according to her, there were three boys on the tracks. One of them got away, but the other two were eventually captured and brought back to the tracks, interrogated, beaten, and then eventually executed. Yeah, wow. Well. Yeah. But they only found two. Right. They only they found three. One of them ran off. The other two were... No, I mean, but they only found two bodies. Right, because one of the boys ran away. Okay. Then the group loaded up the drop into the car, wrapped the boys in a green tarp, you know, the one that never existed, and threw the boys into the trunk of the cruiser, the police car. Mm -hmm. They moved up the track a bit, put the boys on the tracks, and then left. Charlene says at that point she started freaking out and she ran from the scene. She's just like, I can't deal with this. I'm running away. I can't do this. Um, she saw them put the bodies on the track. Yeah, she was involved. Like, she wasn't involved in everything, but she was there. And, you know, I couldn't tell if she w- went there after they were killed or before they were killed, but she knows well enough that they were killed by. It. So she was there practically for the whole thing. Now, here's another fun fact. And these these are little sidebars I put in here. The thing about Charlene, she was also the ex of a man who was a convicted drug felon. The name of this man? Roger Clinton, the brother of Bill Clinton. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. So, now, at this point, a new grand jury has been called, the one I mentioned before. Dan Harmon, who is again in charge of this grand jury... He uses it to find out who, like, at this point, now he knows someone is ratted on him. Uh So he's using this grand jury to try to figure out who did it. And his plan is to get these people and try to ruin their reputation a bit. So if they ever go to court and he's prosecuted by ruining their reputation, he can say that they're just retaliating against me Uh because I put them in jail. So he's trying to figure out who these people are so he can take action. Um, oh, I thought you were raising your hand. So he's calling all these people, you know, his connections, trying to figure out who knew about him, this whole thing. And part of the reason he did... Uh, so yeah, he's trying to figure out all this stuff. So he pretty much called anybody he ever went to bed with to try to go to the extent <laughs> to find out how now this rumor and shit are spreading around. Pretty long list, considering who we're talking about. And I know for real, Mm -hmm. Dayton's everyone's mom and shit. Um, Now let's get back to Keith McHaskell, the meth dealer there. So um, the meth dealer that was on the tracks, he was called to speak in front of the grand jury. And now these are the two witnesses that I had mentioned before. Steve McHaskell, he was called to testify in front of the grand jury but before he does he gets stabbed to death in his driveway keith coney yeah big coincidence keith coney the boy on the motorcycle that drove them back he dies in a mysterious motorcycle crash a few months after kevin and don were killed yeah now like in signs like in signs. <laughs> what? I like that movie. Um, so he refused to tell authorities anything. He refused to tell them what he saw. And obviously because he saw what well, he saw essentially what went on on the tracks. So he knows he can't go to the authorities at this point mm-hmm. because he saw everything. And the only thing he would say to his father was the cops did it. Was the only thing he would say to his dad. So signs show during his crash, he may have been being chased, and he may have also already had his throat slit. Mm. 
before the crash. But there was never an autopsy done on him. Uh, uh. His throat was slit. When was he talking? This was after his throat was slit? These were two witnesses. Wait, what? His throat was slit. So pretty much the other witness who was being called to testify, Mm -hmm. he got into a mysterious uh, motorcycle accident. And, but... I guess, I don't know how substantiated, or I guess that's why it's a rumor. But it's a rumor that his, thr- like, let was see. No, I, I get it. I get it. Oh, okay. Um, so he couldn't testify, obviously. But at this point, the grand, the new grand jury finally concluded that instead of probable homicide, that this was now a definite homicide. So it's gone in stages. Suicide, accident. Probable homicide, now definite homicide. Okay. So, eventually, Prosecutor Dan Harmon, now I'm just doing it on purpose. He's a prosecutor this time. Yeah. He finds out about his girlfriend, Charlene, and her testimony. So, he decides to set her up and personally bust her for a small amount of drugs and weapons charges. So, he arrests her and hands her the warrant personally even though he had been dating her and having her as his drug mule. He prosecutes the case himself. Oh, wow. Right. And, uh, and even though it's her first drug offense, which more than likely would be usually like probation or something, he offers her, (laughs) he offers her a plea bargain of 116 years. The fuck? Man, he had to know that that was going to get appealed or... No? I think to this... Well, I think she got out maybe like five years ago because she ended up getting 30 years in prison. How much did she serve? Do you know? Um, I don't know. So, yeah. He... like Which you think would be unfair. It's just like... My first shout out would be like, he was my boyfriend. Why is he prosecuting me? Or something, yeah, you know? Exactly. But small town justice is justice. <laughs> yeah. Just us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so now, like this one, when anyone around tried to look into the case or the surrounding cases, they would be all set up for failure. One example I give you is a woman named Jean Duffy. She was the new appoint, newly appointed federal narcotics investigator of for the town of Bryant. Uh, so she's hired, and she's told by you know she's hired. She's told you know, hello, welcome, you know, glad you're here. Hey, you know what? You know, don't don't look into any drug charges involving our people. Okay, you know. It just don't yeah just there's nothing there but just so don't even bother there's nothing there just wanted to let you know probably shouldn't have even mentioned it. <laughs> for real i was just like and i even put that in there so it's like but which then and this would happen to apply to anyone she began to search so uh and when she starts searching she starts to uncover the cover-up about the boy's death and Eventually, Prosecutor Dan Harmon finds out about her searching through everything, and he starts going ham on her. Um, He's very pissed, and he starts to begin to launch a smear campaign against her, stating everything from embezzlement to child abuse. She was called to testify and hand over anything that she knows, which, when you're called in subpoena, you have to go in. Um... She refused, which could have led to her arrest, but she was eventually told by an informant of hers that Harmon is trying to get her arrested to be put in jail and plan to have someone kill her in jail. So that's what he was trying to set her up to not respond and not hand over stuff so he she could be arrested, sent to jail, and then killed. So... So, yeah. And see, that's what, uh, again, when I was saying about, like, a lot of this is 
could be deemed quote unquote fact because these are all stories that cross each other by people who don't even really know each other. Mm-hmm. So, um, at this point, unfortunately, she Jean leaves her job and hightails it out of there and she goes into hiding and moves to another state and then eventually becomes a teacher. So, all of that has happened. And, you know, shitstorm, like I said, it's connected to a lot of shit. Bill Clinton, crooked doctors, nurses malpractice, drug trafficking, all of that. So all of that has happened. But in 1996, Harmon finally gets caught for all of his doings. He's convicted of racketeering, conspiracy, extortion, and drug possession with the intent to distribute. Because of that, he gets 10 years in prison. Actually, fucking happened. Yes, about ten fucking. Right, but he's released a nine. Uh Yeah, to add to that, (laughs) a country club prison too. But he then gets arrested again for more drug charges, and I believe, and I'm not going to completely substantiate substantiate this. I believe he's still in jail. So sorry. (laughs) We all had a turn. Okay. (laughs) So so yeah, and that's what I mean. All of this turned out to be true, that he was a drug kingpin. He was leading this drug trafficking system. All of that turns out to be true. And um, later in the 2000s and on, one of the police who was allegedly on the track that night was arrested with his wife on many drug charges and sentenced to decades long terms in jail himself. Um, And then a few other arrests of some of the men that were supposedly on the track with him were arrested along Mm -hmm. as well so now going back to the parents the parents have been trying hard to get cooperation from the county authorities but have had no luck and the reason that is oh backtrack on this so like i said for the 30th time the parents were trying to get cooperation from the authorities the county authorities to get things answered finally and, you know, they did all that they could, but they had no luck. And do you know why? Because the cops were involved and didn't want and that to be exposed. Probably, because remember, she's going to the county, yeah. and this was local issue. She goes to the county, and the reason why is... And somebody's related to somebody over there. Yeah, uh, a man named Rodney Wright was the new district attorney. And who's Rodney Wright? The nephew of prosecutor Dan Harmon. Oh my God. So, so, as recently as 2015, Linda Ives, Kevin I's mother, has filed suit against multiple agencies for not abiding by her Freedom of Information Act request and not handing over info regarding the boy's death. The government responded by asking the courts to the, dismiss her request because it's still an active investigation. Yeah. And it's kind of stuck because that means she's just stuck at this point. And active is that how, how actively are they on this active investigation? It's kind of yeah. like those guys building that park I was telling you about. Yeah. And it sucks because then what do you do? And, you know, yeah, but the case is still unsolved today, mm-hmm. technically. And to end this, um, I want to go and say, end it off with Linda Ives. Linda Ives says, anybody have to burp or anything? Because I want this to be like a good final ending. Yes. Okay. Linda Ives says, it's not a political issue with her because they were never a political family. But until the Arkansas political machine reached in and destroyed the tranquility that they had as a family. And that is a story of the boys on the track. Wow, that's kind of that's really messed up. Yeah, that's um, it's all over the place. Hardly any justice served at all. None. No, like just... I mean, Harmon got arrested, which is great, but it wasn't even for anything that was related to this. Right. You know, because technically, all the other horrible things he was doing. Because technically, to every government official and office, the case is still unsolved. And it sucks that the new district attorney just so happens to be the nephew of the person who was allegedly involved in killing these boys. 
a small town in Arkansas. I mean, yeah. That's the state that just elected uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Is this she from Arkansas? I don't know. Huckabee. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's crazy because it's something that definitely should have been solved a long time ago because it, it's oh, yeah. it's clear and it's because they have witness testimony. But like he said, like I said, he said he ended up putting one woman in jail who could have testified against him mm-hmm. and two others ended up dead. So it's like. Yeah, and that's the sad part is it's like it wasn't even an accident or that they shot him. Everyone was in on it. This is what's wrong with everything. This catch you. Yeah, and then to come to find out that the doctor overseeing this shit, or at least the original one, was a representative of Bill Clinton's mother's malpractice suit. You know, so it's just like all these things that it branches off into and and then his stupid fucking rulings of like, you know, suicide, but five times shot in the chest. And And in on it, too. Oh, I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was definitely in on it. It, It's yeah. At least getting paid off. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's my story. That was a great story. Great, terrible story. Thank you. About a dick. Yeah. I mean, essentially, you break it down to the core. It's about Kevin Eyes, Don, and a dick named prosecutor Dan Harmon. Yeah, a dick named prosecutor Dan Harmon. <laughs> prosecutor Dan Harmon, comma dick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for listening to my story this week. Hope you enjoyed it. If you liked it, make sure to leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Bent Podcast and check us out. Check out some pictures and photos of the stories that we tell. And until next time, get bent. Bye. Bye. <laughs>